Uh, thanks everybody for having me here today. It's always a pleasure. I've, I've had an opportunity to come here and speak on a couple of different topics and I always enjoy coming down here and speaking to you guys in this beautiful building. So I really appreciate it. So um, as Tiffany said, I have a very broad background and it gives me an opportunity to speak on several different topics. Um, you probably wouldn't think about personal or self-defense being wellness related, but it very much is, and we'll get into that topic a little bit. Um, we're going to, this is mostly going to be a discussion about self-defense and how we can train both our bodies and minds, and hopefully uh, we'll learn a little something along the way, and it might motivate you to take some action at the end of it. So, it seems like I did a talk several weeks ago on a different subject, um, and it seems like almost every talk I do these days has something to do with 9-11. Uh, you know, our world just changed that day. And whether we realize it or not, we are all combatants now. There are terrorist groups across the world that would love an opportunity to uh, perform a terror act on you. So, no matter what it is that we think, every single American walking the streets today has a bullseye on their head. You have to know that as a reality. That is a fact of life. Okay? So, we also don't have to be, uh, you don't have to watch the news all the time because it's like whenever you do watch the news, it's obvious the amount of violence and shootings that are happening on a daily basis are escalating. Now, our country has been, you know, notoriously violent for, for a while, but is it really the news that is trying to find these, if it bleeds, it leads stories, or, or is violence really escalating? I, I think that's a question. Does it feel like our country is getting safer or a little bit more violent? I think it's getting a little bit more violent. So we see it more and more every single day. So it's not just the, the threat of, of terror, um, it's the threat of I'm walking down the street and you know what's going to happen to me today? Who's the, who, who is the guy running loose down, you know, running around town that I might be a target, I might become a victim? So security is a central component to happiness and well-being. And it's not just financial security. When I say financial security, everybody says, oh yeah, absolutely, got to have it. I got to check that box. But it goes a little bit deeper than that. It's phys physical security for yourself, your, your loved ones, and, and family. And have I checked that box? And it's a serious discussion that we'll look at today and talk about. Okay? It's always in the back of your mind. Trust me, whether you realize it, and are conscious of it, in the back of your mind, your personal safety is always in the back of your mind. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background here, some biology. There was a, an archaeological dig in Gettysburg several years ago, and they discovered a mass grave where thousands of muskets had been buried. And it was on both the north and the south. Now, as they began to clean up these rifles and go through them, what they noticed was thousands of these rifles have been loaded multiple times. And we're talking about the old school, put a ball in there and shove it down and fire kind of thing. And everybody can remember movies where they've seen basically they're in line, they fire, they reload, they move forward and keep moving in this sequence. So the archaeologists are looking at it and going, okay, this is a little unusual. Why are these rifles mo loaded multiple times? And then they started finding more and more rifles that have been loaded five, six, seven, eight. The whole chamber, the whole barrel has been loaded but not fired. Interesting question as to why, right? No. What is happening is... The soldiers are loading the weapon and going through the motion and waiting for the signal to fire and not pulling the trigger. And then reloading and not pulling the trigger. There were studies done after World War II. Fewer than 
of the combatants that basically landed on the beaches of Omaha and fought World War II fired their weapon. Three out of ten men actually fired their weapon. Not what we think about these, these war zones, right? And the thinking, of, the common day thinking of that time is if we land our guys on the beach and they're getting shot at with machine guns, they will return fire. Back then they used to shoot at bullseye targets for training. Going into, going into Vietnam, they started shooting at, at humanoid type targets. So when I was in the military, we shot at human shaped type targets that popped up. You shot at this popped up humanoid target and this ratio went from 30 to roughly 75, 80%. It changed drastically. So what sense does, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, does it? Not the way we think about it. We are hardwired. Our genetic code makes it very, very difficult. You are hardwired to not kill your own species. And every species is hardwired that way. We don't think too much about stepping on an ant, and if we run over a dog, we feel bad about it, but it usually doesn't equal how it feels if we were to hurt another human being. You are genetically hardwired to not hurt another human being. The only way that it doesn't bother you is if you have, are a psycho or a sociopath. And we'll get a little into that too. Okay, are we all together on this? The only people that are out there that don't have an issue harming another human being have some serious mental difficulty, mental issues, and we'll look at some uh, of what those issues might be. So there's been many recordings of, of, of rape, violent crimes, kidnapping, where the victim was absolutely powerless, might even have a weapon and an opportunity to defend themselves and was powerless, unable to do this. Now there's so much guilt associated with this. Coming back to this, and we'll talk about fight flight. There's a lot of physiological symptoms that are also happening in fight flight that are incredibly embarrassing, that leave you feeling with these senses, uh, this sense of guilt that you weren't able to fight. And you don't understand that it's genetically hardwired so you cannot think that you can be in a situation where your life is on the line of you. <laughs> you might be forced to defend yourself. Am I doing something? You might be forced to defend yourself okay. and you're unable to act. Okay? So the question becomes, how do we destroy another human and stay human ourselves? How do we defend ourselves? This is, this is a big issue. I'm, I'm a combat veteran, and I had to face this issue. And I had amazing training. But up until I had to put up a, a weapon and, and put a, 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 you know, my rifle and fire at another human being, there's nope. no level of training that can substitute that. It's something that has to be dealt with right then. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about fight, flight and we added freeze because it's an element you don't really hear a lot about. Everybody's heard of fight flight, correct? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the mental and physiological symptoms of, of fight flight. Lieutenant Colonel Grossman wrote a couple of great books uh, on killing and on combat and he goes into detail about what is happening in the throes of fight flight. And he calls it basically moving into the black. And I'll give you some physiological symptoms of it. Basically imagine going from a resting heart rate where you are right now. Let's say you're at 75. And within a nanosecond, you move all the way up to 220. You are beyond any max heart rate you've ever experienced in, in a fitness session. Okay? All your physiological abilities are breaking down. And I mean all of them. Your small motor units, my ability to touch this button and, and get it and manipulate it, is starting to break down. So you're left with big motor patterns. Okay? Psychologically, your mind has stopped. Okay? So you go into fight, flight, or freeze, and there's about two seconds to make a decision as to which way you're going to go on this. 
You've got about two seconds before you enter this freeze category, and you're completely and totally paralyzed and unable to do anything. Okay? So, if, if we look at fight flight, this is a part of evolution. This is a part of even single cell organisms like a paramecium um, or an amoeba have some level of fight flight. So when we look at it, it's a part of evolution that's allowed us to survive, but is it the best mechanism for saving our lives today? If we have the possibility of training outside of fight flight, shouldn't we look at how we can do that? Shouldn't we take the opportunity to move outside of it? Because we'll talk a little bit about how we can shift out of fight flight. We can experience the fact that I am in fight flight. I need to get out as quickly as possible. So this is a part of evolution, but we don't have to continue to suffer the ramifications of it. We can override it. So how do we do that? Now, we're not going to get into a lot of training today, and that's maybe what you guys wanted to do is eat, lunch, and wrestle, and we can. <laughs> if you want, we can. But in all fairness, if we're serious about self-defense, we really need to be as serious about self-defense as if you had a fitness goal. I want to run a marathon. Well, you had best get busy. You had best get busy. And that means not just with these empty hands, for instance, boxing or MMA or karate, jiu-jitsu, any number of open hand, you also need to understand how to manipulate weapons if you're going to choose to have them at home or in, in this state, carry one. And we'll talk about that as well. So there needs to be some realistic training that deals with the integration of fight flight where you are put in very, very stressful situations. It's called pressure testing where your heart rate is elevated and you're, and you're having to use mental and physical faculties in, in very little bits of, of time. You're forced to make choices as quickly as possible. So the next one, flow state, it's a, sub, it's a topic I, I love to talk about. Flow is a term that is basically given to the highest level of, of conscious state. Has anybody heard of runner's high? Okay. What is that experience when you're in runner's high? Give me some words. Come on, this is interactive. Great. I'll karaoke if you guys don't. <laughs> Cruise control. Cruise control, perfect. What's your sense of time when you're in runner's high? Is there any sense of time at all? What about your effort level? Minimal. Minimal, Minimal. right? Everything is just happening on automatic, right? You're just in the zone. This is the flow state. This is the opposite side of fight flight. So this is where we are really, we have multiple uh, divisions at Studio 2. So we have, we have our fitness, our nutrition. I work with people tactically, law enforcement and military. And then of course our executive division where we're catering to the individual on a needs basis. This flow state is something that transcends all, all those individuals. It doesn't matter if it's fitness, tactical, or an executive. The more time I can spend shifting myself into this state, the better off I am. Because on some level, you guys may not know it, because I know you Basbury people, and I've had a lot of you guys as, as clients. You guys are, are, are all in some level of this fight flight, some level of this stress, right? So being able to shift out of that stress and into flow is absolutely essential. And it takes training. It takes some technical training to learn how to do, but it can happen. <clears throat> so once again, ramifications of overriding all that, because basically keep in mind what we're talking about here. We're talking about how do I better engineer my mind and body to defend myself. And that means hurting another individual. And you may effectively do that, but at the end of the day, you have to go home with that and deal with that. And sometimes it has serious ramifications that don't even come up for years after that. And there's many reasons for, for this, but this is definitely one. 
Can you guys see that picture? You see the great white shark back there? <laughs> Uh, and it's not a play on all the shark attacks these days, in, by any means. So situational awareness, we're going to talk, uh, talk a little bit about uh, just some basic ideas that how you can prevent becoming a, a, a target or a mark. Okay. So situational awareness, incredibly important. Where are you? What is your sense of awareness? Are you here or are you in your phone walking down the street with absolutely no idea of where or when you are? You are a perfect target. That is exactly who they are looking for. They. Movement patterns. So, if we're traveling, if we're going to places, let's just say you're doing business in, in countries, I'll just throw it like Mexico, Central Mexico. Maybe I want to not have the same exact movement patterns every single day. It's one of the first things that a security team will do is to make sure that you're not repeating the same movement patterns. You're not staying in the same hotel. You don't revisit the same hotel. You're always changing these things. Eye contact. Once again, where are your eyes? Are they down on the floor in the cell phone? Right? Or are you looking at every single individual that you see and saying, I see you. Okay? Your eyes are up. Your posture is up. You're not a target. This is a target. Okay? People around you. Paying attention to every single person that's around you as you're walking up and down the street. Do you get a, a vibe from them? Do, do your spidey senses go off when you pass them? Is there something weird going on? Is You have to learn to trust your instincts when we're talking about this category. Because the idea is we have to perceive it before it happens. If you wait till it does, and we'll talk further about this, it is too late. I trained with a world-class martial artist uh, many of them actually, but one in general, he was so good that he just didn't derive much pleasure uh, with, with training with, uh, in the normal uh, fashions, going into a dojo, getting on the mat, working one-on-one. -on -one. He would ride the subway in Washington, D.C. Japanese man, and he would put on big fur coats. He would put on clothes that made himself look like a target. And he would get on the subway and ride the train. And he would just kind of pick up on vibes of people and cross the street and just see if he could basically either avoid or attract attention. It was his way of training. Different level. Conspicuous behavior. Things are out of place. When you're walking to the parking garage, things like that. In, in here you have a, a secure facility, right? But what if there's not? If you're walking through there, you think it's secure, right? But what if you look over and all of a sudden there's somebody there that doesn't seem to belong? Do you pay attention to that? Right? Where are the exits? First thing I do when I get on a plane is I count how many rows forward and backward the exits are. And I'm not paranoid. I just check the box. Okay. I know where I'm at. Okay. Exits in the room. Where are they? Are there police around me? <clears throat> Lastly, how do we do all this and not become paranoid? I'm going to leave you in a place where I, I really hope. I leave you in a place where there's a lot more questions than I'm, I'm supplying answers. I want you to think about these things. How do I do all these things and not become uh, paranoid? Always afraid. Everybody now becomes the enemy. This is not the, the, the point. So, I just briefly am skirting this this topic, and I both by no means am a forensic scientist on the criminal mind, but just to kind of gloss over, who are these people that we're up against, right? So the first thing that we would want to look at is who, what is the mindset that I'm up against so I can better prepare myself? So number one, we have to look at physiological and psychological conditions. Physiological meaning um, there have been many studies on, on brain development that show there is certain types of brain development that shift themselves more towards criminal intention. Okay? The same with psychological. Genes and environment. Believe it or not, there's a genetic code. 
that has a little something to do with this person? Does environment have anything to do with this person? Okay, so the nature versus nurture issue. You've got to think about this person that is trying to rob your home or, or assault you in a parking lot, right? Substance abuse. This person probably very likely is abusing some form of drug. All right? Religious fervor. We talked about that in the beginning. Okay? And I'll connect all these dots. Loss of empathy, impact of actions uh, on self and others, impulsive anxiety, <coughs> loss of fear and feelings of hopelessness. So take all those things and put them together and add the word motivated. That's who you're up against. It's almost not very fair, is it? Think about this person, this motivated person, right, that you're up against. Because you don't have these issues, at least most of us, some of them, right? This is what we're up against, folks. And that is the reality you have to look at is there's a lot of things going on with this person that has led them to want to assault me, to steal from me, to hurt me. Okay? They are a motivated enemy. So here's kind of what I wanted to do to kind of break down the actual altercation. All right? It's always starting, like I said, from a distance. You're going to be, somebody is going to view you from a distance and judge, am I able to take advantage of this person or not? And we're talking, it could be a block away, it could be 30, 40, 50 feet away. But they're observing you, right? And if they're good, you won't know that they're observing you. But they are, from a, from a distance. Once the decision has been made that yes, you are indeed a target, then they encroach, they get closer. There has been many studies that have shown that within 15 feet, let's just say you are carrying a weapon, mace, anything, that within 15 feet, the average person can close on you faster than you can deploy that weapon. Either unholster a pistol or reach in your purse and pull out your mace or your brass knuckles. Right? No? 15 feet, guys. That's, that's from this far. And in your mind, it's like, okay, I still got space, I still got time. In 15 feet, I can be on top of her and she has not had an opportunity to deploy whatever weapon, whatever false sense of security she has in that purse. Okay? 15 feet. From 15 feet, the altercation progresses and it usually looks something like this. This is called a clinch. This is where, where the assault is actually moving into a physical level where they're trying to control your center of mass and manipulate you. And manipulate you into a corner, manipulate you against the wall, or the worst possibility, manipulate you onto the ground. The worst position you ever want to be in is laying on the ground with somebody on your chest. That takes a high level of training and experience and calm to be able to get out of. It is the absolute worst possibility to be in. And if you have a weapon, they're usually somewhere down in here and you don't have the ability to get to it or it's in the purse somewhere. Are you guys starting to understand why picking up on, on this opportunity before it happens? So, so much time in self-defense is spent here. Let's wrestle. It's too late, folks. We can crowd my God, you guys, all month long. And you're not honestly going to be able to defend this situation against that motivated drug dealer psycho. You have to remove that delusion. It takes years of training in martial arts to be able to effectively get out of this situation. I'm waking you up. I'll tell you like it is. Each escalation has different levels of, of defense. So if we are going to explore a martial art, we need to explore a martial art that's going to look at all those things from space, 15 feet, clinch, to the ground. So with Taibo, 
be a good form of self -de practical self-defense, or even boxing, or even just something like jujitsu that's mostly dealing with this. We have to look at it on multiple levels, multiple dimensions. So the inclusion of weapons, everything changes, or does it? It's a question if there's a weapon involved, speaking on the other side. Okay? So I'm assaulting you, and you can clearly see I don't have a, a gun or a knife in my hand. There's one level of fight flight, correct? But all of a sudden, if I have a, a gun, and especially a knife, when we're talking about DNA, there is nothing that will supercharge your fight flight like a blade. Nothing. It's the scariest thing in the world. It does change things. It drastically changes things. It might change your decision on, do I fight this situation? Do, do I comply and be patient and try to get out of this in a different way? And I've been in, in both situations, unfortunately. So we're going to talk a little bit about some legal, and here I am. You guys probably know more about this than me. But I thought it was very important that we at least go through you know, what, is, what do I have the opportunity to do uh, without litigation? And um, along with the Castle doctrine, doctrine in Tennessee, there is the Stand Your Ground Laws, which basically means, given certain circumstances, you have the right of lethal force in a, in a personal self-defense situation. And there is laws or ideas, it's loosely kind of put out there, I think, purposefully, so that we can look at it and say, okay, is this really a self-defense situation? The first one is person not engaged in unlawful activity. So if you're robbing a grocery store and a citizen pulls a knife on you and tries to stop you and you kill them, that's not self-defense. Okay? You can't be engaged in unlawful activity and call it self-defense person in a place they have a legal right to be, once again, your home, your place of business, that kind of thing. Reasonable belief of imminent danger of death or serious bodily injury. So a reasonable belief. Uh, would it be a reasonable belief if I had a baseball bat coming at you saying, I'm going to kill you? Okay. What if I had a wiffle ball bat? see where we get a little bit vague and we saw this with the Zimmerman case and I don't want to go one way or the other but you know it's it's subject to a, a jury looking at it and saying okay this man was in fear for his life or he was not or a woman the danger creating the the belief of imminent death or serious bodily injury is real or honestly believed to be real at the time and to me the way I understand that it's kind of a combination of all of the above. It's a little piece of all of those things. Okay? The belief is founded on reasonable grounds. Okay? So basically, if you are somewhere you're supposed to be, you have a weapon, or don't have a weapon and, and get one, and you're in your place of business, your home, whatever, you have a legal right to stand your ground and fight should you choose to do so, and you're protected in this state. Key takeaways. Uh, understand the biology and the stress response. I have absolutely um, read every single article published that I can imagine in book on fight flight and, and also flow, what, I, what we call flow. Um, it is absolutely essential that you understand this biology, that you understand your biology. Number one, because there can be so much guilt associated with the response you may have in a, in a real fight. Who's been in a fight, fist fight in here? Nobody? It's, this is a circle of trust. <laughs> okay? It's, a, it's an experience, right? And, and you're going through some emotion there. Right? You're fighting yourself along the way. We don't want to do this. You don't want to fight yourself and somebody else. 
Situational awareness is absolutely and totally essential. And I'm always on my clients all the time because they come in, they're on their cell phones, I'm, I'm yelling at you guys, and they're everywhere other than right here, right now. And not now, now. Now is gone and now. They're everywhere else. You cannot be effective at anything if you are somewhere else. I don't care what it is. Be prepared with skills and knowledge. So if you're serious about this, if it motivates you, I really challenge you to go out and get some realistic training. And um, uh, I personally have, uh, I have an open carry permit. Uh, I carry a firearm. Uh, I believe in it and do so on a daily basis. Uh, the mind and body are the greatest weapons. All else are tools. To me, that's the number one takeaway. Your mind and your body are the greatest weapons. The greatest weapons. Everything else that you put in your hands is simply a tool. And now we're going to wrestle. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs>